It's been one month since the Hamas's attack on Israel shocked the whole world. The IDF has gone in all guns blazing into the Gaza Strip. Where does this conflict go from here? What are the key X factors which could change the shape of the conflict? And what does the world need to be most wary of? To talk about this, I'm joined on the broadcast by Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner, international spokesperson of the Israel Defense Forces. With us also is Ambassador Hussam Zaid Zomlod, uh, the ambassador of the Palestinian Authority to the United Kingdom. Abhijit Ayamitra joins us, senior research fellow at the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies. And we've got Lieutenant General Rameshwar Yadav for a military perspective, former Director General Infantry of the Indian Army. I want to go across to Lieutenant Colonel Peter Lerner first. Uh, Colonel Lerner, I want to ask you about your battle plans and your own assessment one month on about how this war is shaping up from the IDF's perspective in terms of achieving your mission objectives. Are you on schedule, ahead of schedule, or do you think progress has been much slower than you would have liked it to? forward every day it's getting closer and closer to our objective indeed destroying and dismantling hamas as a governing authority as a terrorist army at the end of this they will no longer have that power or the ability to uh, uh, launch and strike and use the gaza strip as a staging ground against our people you may be able to kill the top hamas military and political commanders but the biggest question is how will you root out the ideology of the hamas and the concern that each a civilian who's killed, his relatives potentially become more and more hardline, and that the idea of the Hamas stays alive even if the military wing of the Hamas uh, is destroyed by the Israel army. No, the ideology isn't our challenge. The challenge is restoring safety and security to the people. This terrorist organization can no, never ever wield the powers of government to build a terrorist army that conduct, based on the powers of the government, um, the ability to brutally massacre, butcher, rape, behead, dismember and abduct Israelis. One of the biggest questions globally is about what happens in Gaza the day after. The day after being when uh, the Israel Defense Forces have won militarily established control once again over uh, the Gaza Strip. Then. Have you started thinking seriously within the IDF about what happens next? Who runs Gaza uh, once the Hamas has been militarily vanquished? Now, Israel does not want to rule Gaza. This has uh, been since day one we've been saying this. We left Gaza in order not to return. But the security reality, the security regime that needs to change. Ideally, the Palestinians of Gaza would have to determine their own destiny of how they want to be ruled. Uh, but it cannot be with a terrorist entity that uh, uses the powers of government in order to attack us and, and launch a war against us. Um, the reality, of course, it, we understand it will be a long process. It won't be a short war uh, because of the challenges of urban warfare, of a terrorist organization that has deeply embedded itself within the civilian arena that is uh, exploiting, cynically exploiting, the civilian arena to the benefit of its of its operations of its uh, ruthless merciless operations and this is precisely what we're up against and so we understand it's going to be a long process and there may be intermediate uh, times that the idf will uh, uh, control secure and make sure that hamas can never have that power again um, for israel i would say especially in the aftermath of the of the massacre of october 7th um, any security reality on the ground will be better than the one that existed on October the 6th. One of the realities on the ground is that 240-odd Israeli citizens are still hostage uh, with the Hamas. And we've seen uh, continuing and increasing protests in different parts of Israel demanding that the government and the army do more to bring these hostages back to safety. How are you viewing uh, these protests and the concerns about the IDF not doing enough to try and bring uh, these Israeli hostages back home? Hostages are one component of our war, war effort. The, the mission objective is to bring them home safely and securely. Uh, Hamas are responsible for their well-being. We have demanded that the International Committee of the Red Cross have access to them to assess their well-being. I'm not aware that that has happened yet. 
Of course, their presence in the Gaza Strip is a, uh, an important component of our operational activities and planning. But I would say that uh, you know, we are utilizing all of the tools and capabilities that the IDF has in order to try and find, locate, and rescue. We've already rescued one of the hostages, Ori Megidish, um, from uh, Hamas's hands. And indeed, there's a huge challenge that this will uh, uh, that this poses for any military. There is obviously also the diplomatic efforts, which are ongoing. Ultimately, has, Hamas have to release the hostages. They have to release them now. Okay, that's what your expectation at least is. Hezbollah's leader, Hassan Nasrallah, spoke of all options being open, didn't uh, indicate that the war would escalate, but said that's something the Hezbollah is ready for. How does the IDF view the prospect of a two-front or a three-front conflict? Hezbollah needs to operate very cautiously. They need to watch very closely how we're dismantling and destroying Hamas in Gaza. Uh, indeed, over the last month, we've seen increased activities on their behalf against us. Uh, with uh, the, yesterday, an Israeli was killed in an exchange or in an attack that, that originated from uh, from southern Lebanon. Um, you know, Hezbollah needs to choose if they are uh, a, a representative, a tool of the of Iran, or a representative or a tool of Lebanon. Uh, they have a huge impact on what happens in Lebanon. I think they need to decide. Who they listen to um, and, and my message to the Lebanese government would be one of you need to take control and take charge of what Hezbollah is doing on the south they are jeopardizing the sanctity of Lebanon and so yes there is a concern that there will be an escalation we've seen an escalation over the last month Hezbollah have conducted attacks with anti-tank guided missiles rockets mortars sniper fire machine gun fire drones all of these have ha happened in the last month we are uh, taking every necessary step in order to be strong in our defenses. So both um, uh, evacuating people from the area, uh, all of the towns and communities across the five kilometer radius from the border have been evacuated and we've um, over 80 percent of the people have left. In the end of the day, um, uh, we are uh, reinforcing our forces on the ground okay. in the air and at sea. We've uh, only less than half of our air force is utilized in the south against uh, Hamas. So we have a, a strong capability to um, engage Hezbollah if necessary. We don't want to, but we are prepared to if need be. You know, one, one last question before I go across to our guests in India and the ambassador of the Palestinian Authority, Colonel Lerner. Massive pressure now on Israel to declare a humanitarian ceasefire. Anthony Blinken, the American Secretary of State, was in the Middle East, Jordan, Egypt, Qatar, all asking for Israel to pause hostilities to allow for a humanitarian ceasefire. Anybody asking for a humanitarian ceasefire but not exp explicitly addressing the issue of hostages, is uh, their, their recommendations or appeals fall on empty ears in, here in Israel. Um, of course, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu said and echoed this yesterday. From our perspective, the humanitarian effort is part of our war effort. And indeed, we're creating uh, evacuation corridors from north to south so that people can ex exit the north to go to a safer area in the south of Gaza Strip. We are making sure that their humanitarian assistance and aid continues to flow into Gaza okay. from Rafah. Uh, and about 100 trucks now daily are coming in. This is uh, part of the ongoing effort. And we're maintaining open channels with the international humanitarian organizations okay. in order to mitigate the effects of the war. At the end of the day, this is a war, and we are uh, uh, determined to defeat Hamas, destroy their capabilities. And indeed, they okay. have, as a governing authority, I think we've lost him. For a Palestinian perspective, I want to go across to Hussam Said Zomlot, the ambassador of the Palestinian Authority to the United Kingdom. Mr. Zomlot, welcome. Uh, it's been one month since the Hamas's dastardly attack across Israel. Uh, every single call that's been made to Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for there to be some kind of a humanitarian ceasefire has been rejected. The IDF at this time determined not to stop till the time the Hamas has been wiped out. From a Palestinian perspective, how do you look at the last month and where we've reached so far, sir? Well, right from the beginning of this, uh, we have been warning the world that Israel, with its current prime minister and government, will only use uh, what happened 
uh, for a long-term plan of actually uh, waging uh, a war of genocide against the Palestinian people. And what has happened since the 7th of October proves that Israel has been hysteric. Uh, we have had genocidal rhetoric and discourse from Israel. And regrettably, some Western governments, primarily the US and the UK and others, have uh, really at the beginning gave uh, some sort of a green light uh, for such an assault. And it was interpreted by those fanatics in the Israeli government uh, as a card blanche to do what they have been doing over the last month. Uh, this uh, war of Israel is not against Hamas. This war of Israel is against the Palestinian people. As you know, more than 10,000 innocent civilians have lost their lives. Almost half of them are children. Uh, uh, an utter destruction of homes, of hospitals, of schools, universities, utter destruction of the infrastructure, uh, the unprecedented humanitarian catastrophe in every uh, sense. The UN and UN agencies are telling us horrifying, horrifying accounts of sheer human uh, suffering. Hospitals are running out of generators and fuel and electricity. You have babies and incubators that are, are might die because of these incubators running out of, uh, of energy. Uh, uh, and you're talking about the break uh, out of diseases among uh, populations. Israel has forced hundreds of thousands of Palestinians to leave their homes to the south under the pretext that the south is safe, yet they have been bombarding uh, the south heavily. Uh, killing hundreds of Palestinian innocent uh, civilians. But in the Ambassador South. Zomblot, when leaders of the Hamas have been asked about, for example, something like tunnels, saying that, you know, would uh, civilians in Gaza get to use the tunnels? They've been reported to say, no, those tunnels are for Hamas fighters. The civilians are the responsibility of the United Nations. So it's not as if the Hamas, which is, uh, for all practical purposes, the ruler of uh, Gaza, has been wanting to take care of the Gazan civilians. They're only taking care of their military infrastructure and their fighters. They've left the civilians uh, to their own mercy, so much so that in some cases, civilians haven't been allowed to leave because the, Gaz because the Hamas wanted some protection uh, to save themselves from the IDF's attack. You go and ask a Hamas uh, spokesperson for that. Uh, I'm, not, I'm the wrong person to ask that question. However, uh, 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 the only ruler of Gaza is Israel. Israel fully occupies Gaza. It decides who comes in, who comes out. It decides even the level of food, water, electricity, telecommunication, internet, what have you. And you know Gaza has been under draconian siege by Israel for the last 16 uh, years. And therefore, uh, the, uh, Israel is in a state of full military occupation of Gaza, the West Bank and East Jerusalem, as per international consensus for the last 56 years. Now, uh, as an occupier, Israel has uh, the responsibility, the full responsibility as per international resolutions and international provisions uh, to protect civilians under its military occupation. What we have seen over the last month, as we have been seeing over a 75-year period, Israel deliberately, deliberately targets uh, civilians. This is a military doctrine. In Israel, whenever there is such a confrontation, they go after the civilians, they go after the civil structures, uh, and the doctrine goes like once they terrorize the civilians, they would pressure uh, the fighters. And the UN has provided shelters uh, for the Palestinian people in Gaza over the last month, but Israel has been bomb bombarding uh, these uh, shelters. I met you, senior UN officials the last couple of days, and they gave me uh, 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 an unimaginable uh, account of what is happening in their shelters. Uh, they, they have no fuel for their trucks to bring water or electricity. Diseases are uh, spreading, and the situation is simply, simply horrific in every, uh, in every sense. So we must stop here blaming uh, the victims all the time, and we must stop finding excuses for the Israeli atrocious, murderous attacks against innocent people that has been reported all over the world, including your own uh, channel. What is happening is crimes against humanity. What is happening is tantamount to genocide. And now what we need is first to cease fire, to immediate cease fire, to stop the aggression against our people. We need to think about how do we exchange uh, uh, hostages. 
and relief people. We need to think about a huge, massive humanitarian aid and assistance corridors from all over the world, including from our brothers and sisters in India, to elevate the unprecedented, unprecedented human suffering in Gaza caused by uh, Israel. We need what, to think one of about the big what, questions, what, Ambassador, that's being asked. Need to think, yes. we, need to think, we need to think about what Israel is doing in the West Bank. It's not just Gaza. We need to follow what the uh, Israeli illegal militias, settlers, uh, wreaking havoc in the West Bank, rampage in every sense, killing many, many uh, Palestinian innocent people as we as we speak. And therefore, this is not just the, the Gaza situation. This is all over the Palestinian uh, territory. And therefore, we must get the record right and we must not parrot what Israel comes out with, especially that Israeli politicians have been hysteric, genocidal, and we need grown-ups in this conversation. And it must be countries like India, like uh, uh, other major countries that really uh, uh, prov provide sanity now uh, before it's too late. And we need to bring everything back to the root causes. And we need to tell Israel and the world that it is about time that the Palestinian people regain their rights. It's about time that the occupation ends. It's about time that international resolutions are implemented. And it is about time that international accountability are, is upheld. And uh, everybody who commits war crimes are uh, brought to justice. One of the big questions is what happens the day after. It's quite likely, given the military prowess of the Israel Defense Forces, that they will be able to vanquish the Hamas in this war, and then uh, Israel will once again control Gaza. The question is, will the Palestinian Authority step in to administer Gaza along with an Arab coalition? A lot of conversation at this time globally about who will run Gaza once the IDF wins. Will the Palestinian Authority want to be a part of this effort? Uh, Gaza is part of the Palestinian uh, uh, occupied territory, uh, and the people in Gaza are Palestinian people, our uh, people, and the Palestinian Authority never left Gaza. The main services, be it health, uh, be it uh, education, be it what have you, is provided by the Palestinian Authority. So this talk is, again, a spin. Uh, from Israel. In fact, Israel just cut uh, uh, funding, not funding, that's the wrong word, our own revenues, our own money that we send to Gaza. So Israel is not really, really undermining or eradicating Hamas. Israel is eradicating the Palestinian people. They are eradicating our families, our structures, our institutions. They are eradicating uh, 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 the Palestinian people hope uh, and the state of helplessness and hopelessness will create uh, much uh, more longer complications. That's why we call for an immediate uh, ceasefire, and that's why we want a focus on the long term, because everything we do right now will affect the long term. We need to give people hope, and hope can only come from a, a confirmation that the oppression and suppression of the Palestinian people have got to end. It's been too long, my friend, 75 years, that this is about time when the world wakes up and say enough uh, uh, is enough, and that the lesson that we learn, that there is no security solution to this, no military solution to this, and there will never be a military solution. And who is going to take over Gaza? The Palestinian people will take over Gaza, and the Palestinian people have their legitimate representatives. But that re 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 legitimate representation, which is the PLO, will only be able to control all the Palestinian territories, the West Bank, Jerusalem, and Gaza, once liberated, and that should be the state of Palestine that would provide protection, protection uh, for our people in Gaza, in Jerusalem, and in the West Bank. The way Israel talks about it is rejected completely and utterly. We do not accept partial or security solutions to Gaza. It has to be political and legal, where Gaza is part of the state of Palestine, and the government of the state of Palestine is the PLO, and we are ready to liberate the land and take over the responsibility of providing protection and services to our people. Everywhere. On the question of escalation, one of the big questions at this time is one month on, is there likely to be escalation on the part of the Hezbollah, the Houthis, the Syrians, and potentially even Iran? From your perspective, we saw Hassan Nasrallah make very uh, combatful comments, but not necessarily signaling direct confrontation. How do you view in the PLO the question of uh, escalation? The, uh, the, the Palestinian-Israeli uh, 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 conflict, the Palestinian cause, uh, is a Palestinian matter. And uh, we are, uh, this is a people's struggle for freedom, for liberation, for independence, for rights, legitimate rights. 
uh, and we need the support of the Arab world. We need the support of the international community, including India. And you know, we have a historic relationship with India during the non-alliance movement and until now. Uh, we need the support of the people of the world, like, when ha like during the anti-apartheid movement of South Africa. Uh, we need support in the in the moral sense and the political sense and the in the legal sense and the popular sense as you have seen in the streets of london of new york washington of paris and berlin of uh, new delhi and everywhere in the world that uh, that we need but we do not need any country any country in this world uh, including iran to hijack uh, our cause or, uh, or to use our cause for uh, their own calculations we need support and solidarity and the Palestinian people struggle uh, is upon us. We need to make sure that we continue the struggle uh, and to fight for our uh, future uh, with, the, with the support for our rights, not for any regional calculations. Okay. So we've heard from the Israel Defense Forces. We've heard from the ambassador of the Palestinian Authority. And I want to go across to uh, Lieutenant General Rameshwar Yadav and Abhijit Ayah Mitra at the Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies. Abhijit? Any sense at all at this moment of how long this war could go on for? It's obviously a question that the Israelis or the Palestinians uh, don't want to think about because Israel wants to finish the Hamas no matter how long it takes. Palestine wants this war to end. We've seen the Russia-Ukraine war just drag on much longer than anybody internationally expected, maybe even much more than Putin expected. Your best sense of how long we could see this military conflict go on for? Um, thanks, Rahul. So, uh, you know, I'm expecting a minimum of at least six to eight months just based on the statements and the mission statement made by the Israelis. Because if they want to wipe out Hamas, look, the bigger tunnels, and we know there are very big uh, tunnel systems. There's a whole underground city out there. Most of them are connected. So, for example, the one under Shifa Hospital, for example, has several nodes which are mutually connected. You pour water down it, you know, uh, uh, recycled seawater down it. You've pretty much got it. The problem is there are hundreds of other, uh, you know, tunnels, fighting holes. I mean, we've seen these, uh, you know, uh, uh, tunnels from which Hamas fighters come out and place RPG rounds right on the tank, bypassing its uh, active protection system defenses and things like that. So removing all of that is going to take a very long time. Six to eight months is the absolute minimum, assuming a consistent and overwhelming deployment of force of the current levels of about 560,000 in full mobilization. If it comes down, obviously, then uh, the uh, uh, thing goes on much longer. Now, remember, there are two parts to this. They first have to do it six to eight months for the north alone, and then six to eight months for the south when the population is transferred. We don't know how long the population filtering is going to happen because they need to figure out who's Hamas, who's not, based on checking before they allow those in the south to move back up north. So it's being done as a sort of, you know, uh, 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 almost like an ink blot, the reverse of an ink blot strategy, where you clean out one part, expand, uh, create the ink blot completely, then move, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I think totally this might just extend to about two to three years if uh, uh, this total eradication is humanly possible. Do you think it is, given the fact that each uh, civilian who's killed has relatives who would A, be very angry, frustrated, possibly more prone to radicalization than they've been in the past, and therefore, while you can take down top military commanders of the IDF, uh, what about the ideology of the Hamas? Does that sink in even deeper, or do you think Palestinians will also try and push back because they've seen the kind of misery, pain, and death it's brought them? Sure. Uh, you know, Rahul, we never really know with these things. You know, uh, everybody believed that, you know, conquering uh, Japan or conquering Germany after World War II, which was the kind of complete occupation that Israel is now looking at again, uh, would, uh, you know, uh, lead to radicalization. In fact, uh, American forces had a very elaborate plans drawn out for a post-occupation insurgency in Germany and Japan. Those did happen. Uh, so, and on the other hand, you know, uh, uh, places like Afghanistan or Iraq, we knew uh, because this happened in our lifetime, we saw exactly what kind of insurgencies did happen. I would suspect that simply because of the sheer bulk of Israeli numbers and the sheer small size of uh, uh, Gaza, and almost, you know, a one is to five ratio kind of of Israeli troops is to uh, uh, Gazans. There's about 2.5 million Gazans 
and full mobilization is 560,000 uh, uh, Israeli troops. Uh, the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan might not be applicable here. It might be more like Germany, Japan, just that overwhelming uh, concentration of force. We also need to be clear about what's coming after this in order to make that determination. Because from what the Israelis are telling us, that there will be a completely new civilian authority with no connection whatsoever to Hamas, which could again lead to a lot of good things uh, if it's done properly. It can't be like, you know, Paul Bremer in Iraq uh, dismissing the entire Ba'ath Party. And if you remember, the Ba'ath Party used to be quite secular. They, they were the only country that used to vote for India in OIC resolutions condemning us from Kashmir. But then it was the same Ba'ath Party that got dismissed because in order to get a job in Iraq, you had to be a member of the Ba'ath Party. Everybody who was in the Ba'ath Party gets dismissed, and that Ba'ath Party colonel becomes the colonel of Al-Qaeda uh, uh, and, you know, massively aids the insurgency out there. You can't have that kind of decision-making. Let's see what happens. Okay. Uh, Lieutenant General Rameshwar Yadav, from your military lens, sitting at a distance, observed from an operational, strategic and tactical perspective in the way the war is shaped up. How long do you see these hostilities and this war go on for, sir? Uh, Rahul, it is a politico-military audit that we have to do. Let's just very briefly, you see on 7th October, uh, Hamas, they struck Israel. So they were very well prepared. They had done their homework very well and they executed the operations offensive operations very well and thereafter they retreated into a massive built-up area that you have and the defense potential of a built-up area is tremendous it requires a lot of time to clear it it entails a lot of casualties which israel probably cannot uh, sustain you see what has happened after the 7th october they surrounded gaza 35 kilometer by 10 to 15 kilometer all right but for one fortnight they do not move forward other than the surrounding this, primarily they wanted to plan from where they have to attack. And in a built-up area, I must clarify to your viewers that attack has got to be a stride the roads, all right? And all these roads are going to be covered up by these tall buildings you have, multi-story buildings you have. Each and every window can be converted into a pillbox. There'll be small arms. There are going to be anti-tank fire from there. They are going to erect uh, roadblocks with mines and IEDs, etc. So it is a very difficult task, but not only this, from troops to task wise, for clearing each house, you require section to a platoon worth of forces, and, and that too after a very heavy casualty. And once you have captured these areas, you have to retain these. So you need more troops. So therefore, the requirement of troops are going to be colossal, that is one. And second, the time required to clear the entire Gaza, in my perspective, it is very, very difficult. You have to see, in this kind of situation, the three things you have to consider. One is uh, uh, the demography, uh, uh, topography, and the geography. As far as topography is concerned, and the demography is concerned, it favors Hamas, because they belong to this area, and all the Palestinians are there, their support base. So they can... How much of Hamas's military the... capabilities, according to you, uh, Lieutenant General Yadav, how much of Hamas's military capacity has been degraded in the past month? And how much of it uh, still stays fighting fit as the Israelis uh, circle Gaza? How much of a military pushback are you expecting from Hamas in its current state? You see, Hamas is going to fight and they're going, going to survive to another day, all right? So they fight on one front wherever Israelis attacks are coming and thereafter it is their own area, they load the complete terrain and they can shift their um, force wherever they, they see there is an offensive coming in. It is going to be a pitched battle and near parallel what you can see in this kind of situation is what happened in Mosul. It took nine months to clear it. Readily in Masood, the IS fighters, they were generally outsiders, and the township was generally vacated. But here, the complete population is there, the multi-story building, and the massive buildings. Clearing them is a big problem. Either you uh, destroy all of them. For that, the kind of ordinance you require is colossal. Does Israel have that kind of uh, ordinance? That is one point. And second point is, there is a war fatigue. You cannot carry on this kind of a fighting in built-up area for months and uh, years together. So, in, in my perspective, what is happening as of now, the battle fatigue is already on. It is more of a stalemate. 
You see, yesterday evening, there is a message that we have reached the coast. So how much territory they have taken? 10 odd kilometers, that also onto the sides. So it will take time. All right, in case this campaign carries on, in my perspective, it is unlikely to carry on the likelihood of ceasefire because more civilian casualties, the perception of Israel being a victim is changing into an aggressor. No, but you're saying and that there's likely to be a ceasefire, to while that might be a rational way of looking at things. Abhijit Aya, given the fact that Benjamin Netanyahu has said very clearly that there's no question of ceasefire till the Hamas continues to breathe, is a ceasefire possible or will the Israelis be able to bash on regardless of international pressure? Um, you see, the clear. military objective which has been set by Israel is, in my perception, is not likely to be achieved. Recently, you are trying to finish an ideology. Ideology is in the mind. For a military objective, you say, all right, capture area so and so. It is feasible. But capturing the minds of people and all those who have highly indoctrinated on their religious cause, it is very difficult. All right. And plus, after fighting on the front, the Hamas cadres, they can march into the civil population. It is very difficult to recognize who is a civilian and who is a combatant. So it is a very, very difficult uh, order. And I don't think uh, it can be, Hamas can be finished. They will survive in some form or other. Initially, yes, because the kind of destruction that is being impacted on them, it may uh, create a small window for some kind of a uh, reconciliation and in okay. that both so you're saying the reconciliation well is likely but Abhijit Aya uh, look at the ISIS the brutal means deployed by the US and the UK led to the ISIS being degraded to the extent where at this moment it's a much lesser threat than it once was at its peak absolutely look uh, let's go back to the previous question because you know, this international pressure that we're seeing, let's first break down what it is. Uh, do you see any countries in private pressurizing Israel, at least the ones that have massive trade with it? I think the only one I've seen actually uh, kick down on Israel right now is China, right? And Israel is also reconsidering its entire relationship with China. Uh, Russia is playing both sides as it always does. The Arab countries in private are egging on Israel because don't forget, especially the monarchical states, they hate Hamas. The only two monarchies that hate, uh, that get along with Hamas, have a, uh, some kind of a modus vivendi with Hamas, are Qatar and Jordan. Jordan is a gone case in the Israeli uh, diplomatic uh, uh, worldview because ever since they tried to annex the West Bank in 1950, uh, uh, two-thirds of Jordan's population is actually Palestinian or of Palestinian origin. Qatar, again, is almost irrelevant in the Israeli uh, diplomatic and military calculus. Uh, we also need to go back to what America has said. They have uh, put out warnings to both uh, Hezbollah and to Iran, uh, telling them that the main reason that their fleet is deploying both to the Mediterranean, the fifth fleet is being put out to sea out of Bahrain, is to prevent any escalation by Iran or Hezbollah against uh, Israel. I think there's going to be a significant amount of diplomatic support, at least as long as we saw for Ukraine, so maybe about eight months to a year, year and a half. And then, obviously, you know, if, if it's an open-ended operation, and I think Israel is very aware of this, that if it's an open-ended operation, that support will wither away, wane, and ultimately dissipate. It will also dissipate internally within Israel. Don't forget, uh, 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 Rahul, we saw South Lebanon. You remember when Yehud Olmert, uh, or was it Ariel Sharon, who withdrew from South Lebanon? There were mothers against uh, mothers of troops killed in South Lebanon, pressurizing the Israeli government in Tel Aviv, in Jerusalem, and things like that. So these things come with a finite shelf life. I would say again, six to eight months minimum, say up to a year, year and two months maximum in terms of um, uh, how long Israel can resist. Well, we're in the realm of probability, but you've heard two uh, sharp brains give us their insights on what they think might happen next and how long it may take. For the time being, Lieutenant General Ramesh. Uh, Rameshwar Yadav, Abhijit Ayer Mitra, uh, Ambassador Husam Said Zomlut and Lieutenant Colonel Lerner for joining me on the News Strike. Thank you very much.